Welcome to a new week of The Perspective with Mike Sherbineau and Julie Stoutland. Well, some say Canada is a country that has lost its foundational faith. While that may be true, in 2019, over 68% of Canadians say they have a religious affiliation and over 54% said their beliefs were very important to how they live their lives. Well, that's why all this week we're featuring people who are living their faith out loud, proud, and most importantly, free. Olympic figure skating great Elizabeth Manley is here to talk about overcoming depression in her darkest nights. Plus, God speaks to us in many tongues, and Pastor Van Moody speaks to us about what unites us and how in Jesus we truly are all one. Director and storyteller Christopher Zalewski's latest film, Theirs is the Kingdom, is a masterpiece highlighting the plight of people who live in poverty and the heart-stirring sounds of Kristen and Keith Getty. Did you know their song, In Christ Alone, written by Stuart Townsend and Keith Getty, is sung over 45 million times in churches every year? This tour de force features a duet with the incomparable Alison Krauss, too. And back on the show, Josh Broom returns with his buddy, Billy Hollywell, to talk about their projects bridging faith and culture. So get ready for God's mercies, everybody, as we rise against the great odds among us to renew our minds, hearts, souls, and spirits. Hey, good morning, everybody. We're so glad you're with us, and good afternoon and good evening, depending where you're watching us <laughs> from today. We're glad you're with us. Julie, I'm glad you're with us. I'm always glad to be here, Mike. You know, this is morning time when we're recording this. Yes. Are, you, are you wide awake? I'm working on it. You're working on it? Well, I'm, <laughs> I'm, you? I'm about 20 minutes away from the coffee kicking fully in. But, uh, you know, we talk about different things. Today is more of a serious it program. Mm. And, and I want to ask you the question. When you're driving down the street in the St. Catharines, Niagara region where you live, mm. there are a lot of homeless people. Yes. We have a lot of homeless people. We do. What do you do when they come and panhandle? You know, for the longest time, I wanted to do something. And, I, and so much of the time, I don't have money on me. And I finally got around to it uh, a few months ago. I now carry Tim Horton's little gift cards, $5 gift cards. I wow. carry like 10 of them and then... And you don't even go to Tim Hortons. <laughs> no, actually I don't, but I carry them. And so that Fantastic. I, because so that's quickly, I can whip it out of the car and just give it whenever I need to. You know, one of the harsh realities that I heard this week was I had a meeting with a number of pastors and the mayor of the city was there. And what he said was that prior to COVID to yeah. where we are right now, the number of homeless people have actually doubled yeah, and uh, that's it. a horrific situation it is. and it's really easy for us to sit here and say wow well, you know everything's fine and we kind of ignore the reality that's out there here's the question do i have a responsibility we want to unpack that a little bit today by taking a look at the award-winning documentary yes called Theirs is yes. the Kingdom. And so we have uh, Christopher Zalewski with us today. We're gonna be talking to him right after the break. You're not gonna wanna miss the program today. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to stir you inside as to your values and what you are doing with your life. And do we have a responsibility for the person outside our car window knocking and saying, do you have a quarter? Well, I'm excited today that Christopher Zalewski is with us. He's an award-winning filmmaker, journalist, and an assistant professor at Wake Forest University. And Christopher, we want to welcome you today to the program. Thanks for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. You know, you have just completed this award-winning documentary called Theirs is the Kingdom. Just give us a snapshot about what it is before we get into what drove you to uh, produce the documentary. Tell us a little bit about the characters in your film. Sure. So the, the film follows the creation of a fresco mural. And I'm sure when some of your viewers hear the word fresco, they think of, you know, the Sistine Chapel or the Last Supper by Da Vinci. And it's in that style of painting. It's a very rare style to see practiced anymore. Yeah, uh, but it follows the, the creation of a fresco in a sanctuary of a small church in uh, Western North Carolina, which is where I live in the Appalachian Mountains. Um, but instead of depicting a traditional uh religious scene, it's actually depicting folks in this community 
who are battling homelessness, addiction, mental illness. And so the film kind of follows the creation of this artwork while also meeting a number of the models who are, who are actually depicted in the painting. Wow. I mean, I just love that. I love art and my daughter's in art in, in school in Sweden. And it's oh, awesome. just amazing using this form of art. And you're connected with Reverend Brian Combs from Haywood Street in that Asheville, Carolina. And he's a big part of the film as he narrates throughout. Tell us about that connection. Yeah, so uh, Reverend Brian Combs is the founding pastor of this church um, called Haywood Street Congregation, and the church has always been focused on um, helping the homeless community in mm. Asheville in, in any number of ways. Um, but actually, when I was I was told about the fresco, I I, I wasn't a member of the church. I, I knew <laughs> about it. I knew about the church, but I just thought, well, this is kind of interesting, painting a fresco in this church. Yeah. Um, but then, from the first time that I heard him talk about the fresco. I was, I was just sucked in. I mean, yeah. he talks about the idea of being seen mm -hmm. and that if I don't look at you, it means that I don't think you're a human being. And what they were trying to do with this fresco from the very beginning was change the way that people in the community see the homeless community, but also how our, we ourselves see each other and how we can view ourselves in a different light. And so that whole symbolism just really drew me to the project. So Christopher, can you unpack that just a little bit more? Because it sure. seems to me you're saying that the homeless person is saying, I want to be seen. Is that true or am I reading more into that? No, I think that's true for if you're homeless or not. I mean, I think everybody wants to be seen. Everybody wants to share their story and, and everybody has a, sh a story to share. And so I, I, think that, I think that's exactly right. I mean, one thing that's interesting with the, with the fresco in particular, that's kind of a, a dichotomy here is, that when you paint a fresco, the, the, the pigment, the paint, doesn't just sit on the surface right. like it, it, it was painted in canvas. It's actually sucked into the wall. It becomes part of the wall. There's a real permanence to this form of artwork. And so, so maybe, maybe you could take a minute and just to give us a backdrop. Like I know there's certain plasters that happen mm -hmm. and different things about a fresco. Like you're talking to somebody who flunked grade three art four times, okay? <laughs> Well, I will say I was not a fresco ex expert at all before this project, and I'm certainly not a fresco expert, but I, mm -hmm. I have learned a lot about the art form. Um, but to your point, yeah, you, you're, you're grinding um, natural pigments into water to create the paint, and then you're painting that into a wet um, lime plaster. So every day you have a, a finite time that you have to paint before that plaster dries. And when it dries, that image is locked in, that paint is locked into the wall. So there's a, you know, there's a very much a permanence to it. Right. And if the artist, Christopher Holt, um, decided that that painting that day wasn't good enough, he'd mm -hmm. have to literally chip the rock off the wall. Wow. I mean, it is that much of a permanent, <laughs> permanent statement. You don't um, want to make any mistakes. <laughs> no, you don't. No, you don't. It, it's, yeah, you can't get an eraser out yeah, for exactly. fresco. So when you're, Creating all of this, uh, Reverend Combs says in the film that the God showed up as his homeless child, mm. born into a world with no room for him. Uh, that message has been skewed a bit by mainline Christianity, and it seems we're always trying to convince instead of listening and being. Mm. Uh, how did we go so wrong? How did we miss it? I mean, I, I think that um, you could point to a number of ways. <laughs> I mean, I, I know for me, um, one thing that really speaks to the work that Haywood Street is doing mm. um, it, is that the idea of faith through action yeah. and being able, to your point, to, to sit with people and hear their stories without an agenda, uh, without any um, you know motivation other than just respecting their dignity and hearing who they are, um, you know, and, and, and raising them up, really. And that's what Haywood Street does. And so um, I don't know if, if I could point to where things went wrong. I, that's certainly uh, beyond probably the scope of my expertise, but I will say that I find what Haywood Street is doing to be a model and should be a model for other municipalities around the world. I mean, I, I think that um, the, the ministries that they're, um, that they're doing on a, on a daily basis, and the Fresco is one of them. They consider the Fresco as one of their key ministries um, because of what they hope um, brings about change in people's, you know, minds and hearts when they come into the sanctuary and see this fresco. And I, I certainly hope the documentary does the same. No, I absolutely agree with you. Listen, why do you think, though, in your own words, 
many of us walk past homeless people or, or, or ignore people with severe mental illness or just hope it goes away. Is it, is it because we're all teetering on the edge? What are your thoughts or your personal experience in this? Mm. I, I think that, um, and Reverend Combs mentions this in the film, I, I think that many of us don't want to admit how close we are to that situation ourselves. Ooh, so good. I think, I think, there's, a, I think there's a fear there. I think there's a terror there for many people um, that if we can ignore this person, we don't have to confront that in our own, in our own life. Um, I think there's certainly an aspect of that. I, I think there's probably, um, you know, aspects in terms of mental health and, and those things as well. But I, I think there's probably a, a, a part of us that, that doesn't want to acknowledge the other because it would be admitting to ourselves how close we are to that. Um, and, and the point is that we are, I mean, we're all one in the same here. And that I think that kind of, um, opening our hearts and minds to the other, whoever that may be, whatever that may be, um, is a big part of this challenge. Um, the film is not a, a documentary that has a solution. All right. That's by design. I mean, this is much more of a, a meditative, um, spiritual, personal uh, journey that you go on throughout the film with the hope of reflecting on your own judgments, um, you know, your own fears um, as it relates to poverty, homelessness, addiction, mental illness, to hopefully come out of that with a different perspective. And I, 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 I fully admit that the film does not do justice to the artwork. I mean, I, I really hope that if you're ever in this region, I mean, it's a 20 foot wide, 10 foot tall mural. My hope is the film kind of captures a piece of that and, and yeah. makes people reflect on themselves. We want to come back and talk mm -hmm. more about it. But Christopher, just before we went on air, you invited me to come down. So uh, hopefully yep, this weekend we'll see you and uh, <laughs> just make sure breakfast is cooking. But we're going to be good. right back talking mm -hmm. with Christopher Zalewski and his award winning documentary called Theirs is the Kingdom. There is something about looking at another human being that requires acknowledging their dignity. That's what I hear overwhelmingly from folks in poverty again and again and again. That's the most painful part. That's the most dehumanizing part, that if I don't look at you, it means that I, I really don't think you're a human being. And so here we are at a fresco saying, these are the people we need to look at to most. We're back again with Christopher Zalewski, award-winning filmmaker and documentary producer of Theirs is the Kingdom. Uh, a powerful documentary that talks about a fresco in Asheville, North Carolina. Christopher, as you did the production, uh, you're an artist, you're watching other artists create something. Did it impact you personally or were you two steps removed? No, it definitely impacted me. I think that um, any of the films that I've created, uh, I take kind of a piece of myself mm -hmm. or maybe a piece of the film with me afterward, however you want to look at it. I, I think that's part of the process of a, of a filmmaker. Um, and so for this film, it was certainly the, the same way. I'll say first from a filmmaking standpoint, um, you know, I, I had a background in print journalism. And so I was used to having my list of questions and I knew <laughs> what my objective was for that specific scene or whatever it might be. But the, the, the art process is really slow with Fresco. And so I would be sitting in these rooms with the artist, Christopher Holt, and the models as they were, they were being sketched for hours. And I had to go in and kind of no list of questions, no agenda, just listen to these folks' stories. Um, and that was a really powerful experience. I mean, to go in and just say, tell me about your life. Right. And the other side of that that constantly amazed me was, was how open people were to share their stories and how honored I was to be the, you know, kind of that conduit. Um, and so that was a really powerful experience that, that kind of changed my pers perspective on filmmaking a little bit was that right. sometimes I don't need to push the envelope. I just can sit there and listen and, and watch. And yeah. that's when the magic happens sometimes. Well, you know, I'm really curious, Christopher, about some of the models and how they were chosen, if there was any specific story that really stood out to you of their journeys. Yeah, so there are, there's about 30 people that are depicted in the actual fresco. And there was no way we could have all of those folks in the film. We have about 11 in the film. 
Um, and that process of gaining trust mm -hmm. for one to, to paint somebody, the right. artist was dealing with that. And then intimate. I was dealing with it on the other side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To convince people to actually be in the film. And so, um, there's one story in particular, um, a gentleman named Jerry, he's the very last model that you meet in the film. Mm -hmm. And he has a really heartbreaking story of abuse and homelessness. Mm -hmm. Um, but ultimately of hope at the end of his story, but he was somebody who for a long time didn't want to be in the, in the fresco, didn't mm -hmm. want to be in the film and slowly warmed up to the idea. And, uh, one day I was there filming and he just said, all right, let's film today. <laughs> so I said, okay. Grab the camera. Let's, let's go. Um, and he opened up and, and like I said, told this really powerful story that I think ends up being kind of the emotional climax of the film, um, and it was amazing to see the transformation mm. in him after sharing that story. And then later on when the fresco was complete to see himself viewing him in the painting, mm. um, the, you know, he, he, he got emotional and that's in the film as well. And it was just, um, it was just a really powerful part, not even in the film, but for me personally to kind of see the effect that yeah. that could have on an individual when you see yourself in a way that, you've never imagined you, you would be depicted in a certain way. Exactly. I think one of the challenges as we deal with homelessness, it's one thing to watch it, and even through your documentary, it's another thing, as I said at the beginning to Julie, you know, what do you do when the person comes knocking on your car window, you know, for a handout? And we can put people in slots and categories, and somehow we can remove ourselves. Mm -hmm. I'm struggling with the whole thing of what is my responsibility? And I think even if I don't have the answer, I'm wondering if you'd agree with this, it's still a good thing to struggle and not to ignore it. Like, did you go through a struggle with what was your responsibility to these people? Mm. Or were you, as I said earlier, two steps removed? Hmm. I, I totally agree with that. Yes, no, I, I definitely went through a struggle um, with how um, I would avert my eyes to the person on the corner. Um, and I think that you're spot on, like the struggle needs to happen. You're not going to fix the problem by ignoring it. Um, that's a, that's a big thing to realize. There's not a perfect answer. If there was a perfect answer, we, we would have solved this by now, which, you know, is just to say that sounds preposterous. And so it, it, that, I think the struggle is the point. And I think maybe that's the point of the film too, is to make you kind of struggle with it a little bit. That's the, certainly the point of the artwork is to confront people where they are. And so, yeah, I, I don't have an answer for that big, big question. I wish I did, but I will say that it, it changed my um, mindset. It made me not avert my eyes. Mm -hmm. Even if I didn't have money on me or a gift card or whatever else, like being able to look somebody in the eye and nod at them, you know, I know that's a small thing, but you have to imagine folks are used to being completely overlooked yeah. hundreds of times on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Just your sentiment of making eye contact, that's a small thing, but it's its acknowledging their dignity. It's acknowledging their, their humanity. Oh, for sure. And, you know, I, I, I want to ask you a personal question because you don't just come and do this kind of thing. I, how did you get to this point? What was your, your, in a nutshell, what was your personal journey of faith that would brought you to such an amazing opportunity of doing this work? Yeah, well, I mean, in, in, in terms of the profession, I was, I've always been interested in storytelling. I mean, I wanted to be a, a journalist when I was a little kid. I ran like a little newspaper around our neighborhood. And <laughs> I love uh, that. unfortunately, when I finally graduated college and I got into the industry, it was kind of crumbling. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I just kind of adapted and got into to digital storytelling and then eventually uh, documentary. Um, but in terms of this story specifically, because I've made documentaries about station wagons. I've made documentaries about uh, houses built out of shipping containers. And then this is very different from those. For me, it's always, it has to be based in a story mm. that resonates. And, and this story immediately resonated with me for a number of reasons. In terms of my faith journey, I was raised uh, Catholic in Northeast Ohio. And when I, when I graduated from high school and I went to college, I didn't, I was kind of struggling with my faith. I didn't quite know how I felt about it anymore. Mm. And, um, that continued for a number of years. And when I was, when I was introduced to this church and introduced to this story, um, and I mentioned this earlier, one thing that really stuck out to me was this, this idea of action. Mm. Like, how do you actually live out your faith? How do you live out what you say you believe? That really stuck with me. That really resonated with me. I have a, a five-year-old and four-year-old daughters too. And, and it was something that I felt 
like I wanted to share with them. I wanted to bring them into the church and show them the work that they were doing. Um, and that was transformational. I mean, it really was. It kind of answered some questions for me. And um, and that's why I, I tell people, if you're in this region, like you got to go see the Fresco, mm-hmm. you got to go see Haywood Street, regardless of where you are on your faith journey. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a really powerful experience. It, it certainly changed me. Christopher, we got about 30 seconds left in the interview. I want you to answer one last question. The title, Theirs is the Kingdom. What's it mean? Where did it come from? Well, the inspiration for the composition in the the fresco composition was the Beatitudes. You won't really see that too much because you're taking the biblical, you know, symbols and figures and and putting them in real people. Mm -hmm. But the Beatitudes is kind of throughout the the entire uh, art process. And so it just felt like a fitting, it felt fitting, you know, (laughs) with the Beatitudes. Love it. Man, Christopher, thank you so much for being with us. We're excited for this documentary. And Mm -hmm. our prayer is that it's going to move people to action, just as you've been talking about. We're grateful you've been on the program Mm -hmm. today. Thank you for having me. I I really appreciate it. Yes, thank you so much. (laughs) All right, everyone, stay with us. We'll be right back with Mike and the Word. I hope people that come and see this fresco will allow themselves to feel the terror in their own hearts that that if we're really honest, none of us are that far away uh, from being on the, on the corner ourselves. If we're willing to, to consider that truth that's true for all of us, um, then our response to, to the, the issues of society that ail us will hopefully be different. You know, as we continue to unpack the subject that we've been dealing with today, not just an artistic rending on homelessness, how it impacts us, what we see here today in the ongoing story in the book of Ruth is how that their homeless situation, how their situation in dealing with their huge poverty that they're going through caused them to radically trust in God. And whether you feel you've got, you know, 50,000 or 100,000 in the bank account, or maybe 5,000, it can all be relative. In the midst of it all, we are still called to be people of integrity. And the theme of integrity has been coming out in the teaching the last couple days. And today I want to wrap up this part as we journey through Ruth chapter 3 and also into chapter 4. But I want to read you something. And I believe that as I read it, the story is going to come back to you and you're going to remember, oh, I do remember. Listen carefully. Tuesday dawn cold at the launch site. Yet some distance away from Cape Canaveral on that icy morning, the air was filled with a heated debate. Unknown to the rest of the world, a war of words was taking place behind the scenes. The verbal battle was between clear-thinking engineers and technicians who were saying no on the one side of the argument. And then there were the influential executives and image-conscious bureaucrats who were saying yes on the other. The argument was over the space shuttle Challenger whether it should be launched on that morning, January 28, 1986. And against the strong advice of experts who knew the temperature had dropped too low for the launch to be considered safe, the countdown continued right up to liftoff. And 70 seconds later, to the horror of the nation and the watching world, the Challenger's crew of seven perished in a mammoth explosion as a faulty seal that allowed volatile fuel to leak in and ignite. That was the technical explanation, but the real reason for Challenger's explosion went deeper than the breakdown of an O-ring. It began with the breakdown of integrity, both in the construction of the shuttle and in the character of those who refused to heed the warning. The crisis of integrity is seldom something which happens overnight. Like erosion, its onslaught has been slow and sinister. And you know, as we remember that story, and I can still visualize the horrific explosion in the sky and how debris rained down, as they said, for over an hour. I'm wondering in your own journey today, has there been a breakdown of integrity? Do you feel like the debris is still raining down in your life? Now that's a very discouraging picture to live with and even to process whatever it might be in your life. 
But I want to encourage you today that you can change your thinking, you can change your projection as you begin to understand how God wants you and I to walk out our story. And I want to remind you today that regardless of where you're at, from the story of Ruth, we learn a principle that integrity calls us to wait for God's provision. You remember the key figures at the beginning, Elimelech and Naomi? Elimelech wouldn't wait for God's provision in Bethlehem, so he disobeyed. And he goes down to the land of Moab where God said, I don't want you to go. I don't want you to be there. He loses his life. Their two sons perish. Naomi is left with a mess. And now she comes back to Bethlehem. And you would think, okay, things are going to start to pick up. But the testing is still there. Her integrity is going to be challenged. And now she tells Ruth, who finds favor by reaping in the field of Boaz, because she was certainly a homeless, a very poor person. She says, I want you to wait. This time she says, wait to see what he will do. Wait to see how he will provide for you. And integrity calls for you and I to radically trust in God for his provision. I want to read to you from chapter 3 and verse 18. And Ruth comes back to Naomi and she says, you know, Boaz gave me six measures of barley. It was double what they needed. And he said, you must not go back empty handed to your mother-in-law. And now she says with greater confidence, she's learned the lesson. Wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out. For the man will not rest until he settles the matter today. What was the matter? Well, as I mentioned yesterday, Boaz, what was referred to as the kinsman redeemer, the next of kin. But there was somebody else in between that they found out. And so Boaz says, if he won't redeem you, I will. We're going to talk about that in tomorrow's teaching but the beautiful thing that we need to remember today is that we get on the path of integrity. Once again, I want to invite you to become the person that God created you to be. You can become a person of integrity, but more often than not, it means that we need to wait and be still and trust in God for his provision and not take matters in our own hands. Can I encourage you to wait and trust and know that God will turn up at his time and in his place? You know, Mike, I love how Christopher shared that everybody's struggling with something, and that's the truth. I know I'm struggling all the time, and that's why I am holding on to God's hand to get me through the day. And in the midst of the struggle, we can often be tempted to compromise, to go the other way. Mm -hmm. And I hope that if there's one thing that we learn, not just from Christopher's story, but the stories of other people this week, and especially from the book of Ruth, mm -hmm. is that we see when they didn't trust, it was catastrophe. It doesn't mean that as we're trusting God, life will be easy. No. But we can have the assurance that he is with us. And if I can remind you again today, I want you to know that Christ cares for you. He loves you. And he's waiting for you to invite him into your space to help you write a new narrative with your life today. 